Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Chad Kalick, and welcome back to the Inner Crowded Room podcast for episode number 15. Which, for this episode, I think I'm going to go back and I'm going to answer um, the top 10 questions that I've received from all of you because it does mean a lot to me that you guys leave comments and that you send me comments, you message me comments, and you ask a lot of questions. Uh, maybe things that I didn't touch upon or I didn't explain as good as I could have. So I want to make sure I do that. And we'll do this probably every 15 episodes or so. Um, because there's some really good stuff that you guys asked here that I do want to touch upon. Um, question number one was about uh, the first podcast episode, which was when I was doing uh, the undercover work for the FBI. And the question is, what do you think would have happened if you would have chosen to keep working in law enforcement? Um, I thought about this a lot. And... I honestly think I would have wound up really depressed, <laughs> if not, uh, yeah, dead as I was warned. Um, first off, I think the advice that I got was was right. I was in a dangerous situation and I didn't recognize it for what it was and I should have. Secondly, I think as a child, I was really excited by it. And believe me, at 15 years old, that's what I was. I was a child. I didn't really, you know, uh, see the big picture of what it would mean to work in an environment with crime and death and suffering. And just knowing who I am today, um, that stuff depresses me really easy. So I think had I continued to work in that environment, it would have been uh, probably a sad thing for me. You know, it probably wouldn't have been as happy as I am today. Um, so I'm very glad I found my love for storytelling and I'm very glad that I'm doing this today. So question number two, I know you know Lorraine Warren from AGH, but did you ever get a chance to meet Ed Warren before he passed away? Now, this, of course, is in response to the episode of the White Lady in Monroe um, in Easton, actually, uh, Union Cemetery. I did not get to meet Ed, and it's a big bummer. Uh, it's one of the major bummers of my paranormal career because Ed passed away a little bit, a few years before I actually met Lorraine. And I was a big fan of Ed, and he was a, a tremendous storyteller himself, a, a tremendous orator. He just knew how to use the human language to really describe a situation. And, and uh, he was devout as can be. Um, I'm not going to say that I agree with everything that you know he felt and thought about the paranormal, but I love that man's passion. I loved his passion for the paranormal. And, uh, you know, when you talk about... Um, you know, a pioneer, I mean, geez, you know, <laughs> I don't know that there's any other field in the world that has anybody as important to it as Ed Warren was to the paranormal field. So I did not get to meet Ed. I wish, I really wish that I could have. So um, question number three, did you see Alex Jones go to war against Joe Rogan and post things about his daughter? Um, you know, I did. I saw a couple of clips of it, of Alex just going crazy. And yes, I saw him posting things about Joe's daughter, which, you know, it's funny. Sometimes I forget the things that people don't hear about because they don't live in this city. But um, I've known that Joe had a black daughter for a long time and that he and she was adopted. And um, but Joe's very, very quiet about his family. You know, I don't know Joe personally. I know Brian Callen, which is like his best buddy. And I've, I've ghost hunted Brian Callen's house with Brian Callen. And I've heard a lot about Joe through them. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know him personally. Um, but the Alex Jones thing going after his family, uh, you know, look, as I said in the Alex Jones podcast about the censorship, I'm not, you know, defending Alex Jones as a human being. Um, you know, there's things about Alex that I like and there's things about him that I despise. And, uh, you know, he is a very, very passionate guy. And my guess is that he just feels like, you know, all the cards are on the table. He's been deplatformed. Uh, he's going to have to scream really loud uh, to get people's attention. And he, you know, decided to start talking about Joe's daughter, which I think is uh, a low blow. But you know what? I have not, uh, you know, watched all of it or anything like that. But I heard that they worked it out. And 
Alex Jones was just on the Joe Rogan podcast. So whenever I get some free time, I'd like to check that out because that'll be interesting to say the least. Um, but my point in that, you know, podcast is what scares me is anything that takes away freedom of speech from anybody, how we combat bad ideas is with good ideas. And we need to hear the bad ideas to identify them as bad ideas so we can, you know, address them. Um, that was my overall point. But again, I'm not, uh, you know, an Alex Jones fan. I'm not defending Alex Jones as a human being or his tactics. I'm just defending free speech, period. And I don't think it should be fucked with in any way. I, I really, really don't. Next question. What is the weirdest thing that I've seen in Hollywood that I believe could be related to the occult or the Illuminati? Um, you know, I was surprised that, that this uh, podcast has gotten the most uh, views so far. Or maybe it's just a topic that people are really interested in. Um, as I said in the podcast, I don't have anything that I could point at to the people that I know and say that's definitely a cult. But I have, you know, been to some weird situations and just thought, man, this is this is weird. Uh, and one of the, the weirdest situations I could ever tell you about is when I first got out here, I went to this private party at uh, the Mondrian, which sits right at the base of the Hollywood Hills. And it was one of those just super star-studded parties where you had to know somebody to even get in the door. And uh, my friend, who was an A&R agent, um, actually got me in. And I do remember one thing was really, really weird. They had hired models to do two things. One was to go swimming. Uh, there was a swimming pool um, inside the Mondrian, which is actually a hotel bar, but it's its own thing. And there's a swimming pool, so at night the pool lights up, and the pool is off uh, limits to the public. You can't use it, but they hired models to go swimming and to just act a certain way when they're swimming, to act almost like they didn't have emotion. And then they hired models that were just standing around, and they were standing, like, posed. And I got to tell you, man, it was super freaky to me when you're standing next to a human being with a heartbeat, you know, that is just holding a position like they're a mannequin. And you know they could hear you. And you know they could, you know, they're, they're, they're human beings. And everybody was having these conversations like they, like this was normal and like they didn't exist. And I do remember thinking, this is so freaking bizarre. Now, can I, you know, see that that's connected to the occult or the Illuminati? I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't think that at the time. I just thought this is really freaky. Um, but, you know, what I can say is that I did recognize early on that this is just a different life out here. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. You could also lead, lead a very normal life if you want to. I, I lead what I consider to be a... A normal life. I don't know. Maybe that's just because it's my life, but um, but you could also get involved in all kinds of really weird, freaky shit if you want to. And um, I was freaked out when Rich said to me, "Yes, it's real." I did not see that coming. I did not see that coming. It definitely freaked me out big time, big time. Um, next question, number five. Do I think there was anything about the city of Tombstone that allowed your demonic experience in the winery to occur? Okay. Um, I've thought about that a lot, too. Over the course of time, I would have to say no. Uh, now, if you, don't, if you haven't seen it yet, this is about the podcast where I went to Tombstone and I was invited by a group to come to a winery. And a lot of really weird stuff happened to me that... Uh, it became very obvious to me that something, in my opinion, that was demonic was messing around with me. Um, I don't know if Tombstone, if anything specific about it is, you know, related to me. Um, but I, I, I don't think you should ignore obvious details, meaning I went there. It happened there. Now, Tombstone itself... You know, look, it's a town that's known, you know, for the shootout of the OK Corral and hauntings and death. And maybe that overall energy of that environment, perhaps that had something to do with it. Um, I don't know. But as I said, you know, in the episode, 
during the podcast, uh, because I've had no reason to go back there, I've never uh, planned on uh, going back there, I never made any trips back there, and I don't have any future plans to go back there. Um, that truly did scare me. It, it, you know, I did get out of that city as fast as I could. And uh, I, I don't know if anything about the city or not opened up that kind of doorway or maybe, you know, uh, made me put my guard down. I don't know. But I also can't, uh, I can't say no because I'd have to spend a lot more time digging into it. Um, so I'm just paying attention to the fact that it did happen there. So that's a major reason why I have not gone back. Okay, question six. Are you in contact with any of your Beta, Theta, Pi pledge brothers today? Um, this was about, uh, you know, the Secret Society uh, podcast that I did. And no, I am not. Um, it's so funny, I know. But they're my brothers, right? Um, no, it, you know, once I left the Beta, Theta, Pi house, uh, it wasn't a pretty exit. Um, you know, you go from one moment the night before, you know, when people find out you're leaving of hearing, no, dude, you're my brother. You're my brother. You can't, you can't break up the group and blah, blah, blah. And then you leave and you never hear from these people again. And that was kind of my point the whole time is that you can't force brotherhood. You know, you can't force uh, friendship, you know? And um, once I left, I do know there was one of the kids in the class, in the pledge class that I saw in my classes, my school classes at Iowa State. And he told me that right away they had a meeting in which they were pretty much told, you cannot call Chad, you cannot text him, you can't, you know, like, he's gone, he's left. Uh, I think they actually said something like, he's living with the fuckos and the dormies, you know. So I wasn't an elitist, I guess. Um, so no, I never heard from him again. And uh, it's too bad because there were a couple guys that I, I definitely liked and I considered a friend. Uh, that were in my actual class. Um, and I would have liked to stay in touch with them. But uh, that is not the way the cookie crumbled. Uh, they were not allowed to talk to me. So, uh, Comment slash question number seven. Thought it was brave of you to discuss your battle with opiates. And then question is, did I ever try to help Ryan Buell with his struggles? Uh, first off, thank you um, for the comment about uh, the struggle with the opiates. Um, I don't consider myself uh, brave for doing it. I appreciate the comment, though. I think it's uh, something that I should do because a lot of people are dealing with it. Um, as far as Ryan goes, I get more questions a day still to this day about you know Ryan Buell. And I, I don't talk about it, but perhaps I should because he's talking about his recovery now. Um, I know that because, again, people inform me all the time. And uh, did I help Ryan? When it comes to addiction, you can't really help someone. Like, they have to want to get better. And that's period. It doesn't matter how much you talk to somebody. It doesn't matter how much you beg them to get better. It doesn't matter how much you cry. And if they don't want to stop using, they're not going to stop. Period. And... You know, I hung out with Ryan probably more than anybody else, you know, during uh, the end of Paranormal State, but my contact with him was over pretty quickly because once Paranormal State was over, um, Ryan was kind of off on his own journey and we weren't really in contact much. We, after Paranormal State ended, we scheduled one event in Iowa, which he didn't show up for and, uh... You know, I didn't see him again until a long time later. He was living out in L.A. for um, a period of time. And I knew he was uh, in bad shape. And, uh, you know, when we were uh, on Paranormal State, when I saw that things were uh, starting to become a problem towards the end, you know, look, we definitely had conversations about stuff. And, and uh you know, but you have to understand these things. It's like Ryan is in control of Ryan's world. And I was Ryan's friend. You know, I wasn't his keeper or watcher or anything like that. And, 
you know, when things started getting bad, paranormal state came to an abrupt end. So it all kind of happened pretty quickly. Um, so I wasn't around Ryan at all, you know, during the time period that things got really, really bad. Um, when we were all seeing the arrests and things like that. Um, there's just so much to this story. And I think you could probably tell that, that I could just go on forever. And there's so much that people don't know. And I've always been hesitant to really talk about it because it's so personal and so private. And, uh, you know, there's many lives that were affected and, uh, it's just a longer thing than to answer a single question. But, um, because I put it on here, um, because someone asked, I just wanted to bring it up because I wanted to make the point that when somebody is going through addiction, as hard as this sounds, they are the only ones that can help themselves because they have to, to really want it. Now, if they really want it, Ryan, you know, would have had help for days. I mean, he, there was a line of people that I'm sure, uh, you know, starting with his family, of course. Um, and in the end, I believe that's what happened. Uh, you know, but I don't know. I haven't, you know, we haven't spoke for a long time and, and there's really no need for that to happen. You know, Ryan's got to, you know, get his life together and, and, you know, I always hope in life that there is a road to recovery and redemption for everybody. I know I've needed it. You know, I've been through tough times. I, I think everybody has. And, um, Every human being on planet Earth, you know, I wish the best for. And that, you know, that includes Ryan. Um, but, you know, he's on a long road back. And uh, it ain't easy, you know. And recovery and the, the decision to stop, um, man, it's a hard one to make. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't ever. A lot of people fail. And... Um, it's just a scary, scary world. And that's why there has to be a real solution to this. Uh, this is a real issue, and it's why I'm passionate about who's creating it and who's starting it. It's why that whole episode was about who's actually pushing the drugs in America and who's making them available. Because a lot of people just don't know. You know, they don't know. So, um, I don't know. I feel like that answer was kind of all over the place. But the short answer is, uh, I think everybody tried, tried to help Ryan in, in to a degree. And I know I sure I definitely did. Um, but I, I say that knowing again, they have to want to help themselves. And, um, that wasn't my decision to make, you know, uh, if you can make the decision for people, families would make it all the time, right? They would just say, I want my loved one to stop, you know, or friends would say, I want my friend to stop. So, um, yeah, that's just, that's the truth of it. You have to help yourself in that scenario. So anyways, sorry about that guys. The whole thing is just, uh, an emotional topic to me. So, um, question number eight, you never told us how you want to remember this right. You never told us how you get hauntings out of your home. How did you clear your house of unwanted spirits? Oh, this is the, they come home to haunt. Um, you know, there's many layers and levels to this. In my case, my house was never haunted with something that refused to leave. Or when I moved in, it wasn't haunted. So it really was a matter of just ignoring it and not reacting to it. Now, that sounds easier than it is done. Um, you know, when scary things are, you know, happening in your home, when doors are opening and closing or when you know, uh, you set your keys down, you turn around, they're gone. You know, for a fact, you just set them down. You know, things that, that are common, uh, those things are really spooky. But you really do have to just train yourself to not react to it and to just start living life, uh, living a life of normalcy. And part of that is not going on investigations. It's stopping. It's stopping your, you know, focusing on that world. It's saying, I'm not going to do this anymore. And that's what I had to do for a long period of time is just say, Okay, I'm going to take an extended period of time away from all this stuff. And the more I took time away from it, the less I focused on it, uh, the less things would happen until eventually nothing happened. That, I think you have to be vocal. I think you have to speak out and say, whatever's here, you know, you are not allowed 
to do anything in my home, you know, and, and lay down the law the same way you would as if a living human being walked in and started doing things that you don't like. So I think that's part of it too. So, okay. Uh, question number nine, if a fake alien invasion actually happened, do you think humanity would actually put aside their differences and band together? I don't know. I think that's a big leap that everyone assumes. Um, if it was truly an extinction level event that we feared, well, I would hope so, because if everybody knew that we either got to band together or we're done, I would assume that we would band together. But, you know, that's there's just so many ifs in that scenario. There's so many. And to think that all walks of life would somehow come together, that is a big ask. That is a tall order. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe. Maybe that is exactly what would happen. You know, I, if, it, if it's going to happen, I think we're probably going to see it in our lifetime. Uh, there's just so much to this fake alien invasion thing. There really is. The more and more you dig into it, there's just so much hard information about it and so many weird things that add up. Uh, and man, you know, I'm the guy that like, you know, 95% of most conspiracy theories, I think they're just that, conspiracy theories. And this is one that just has crazy legs, has crazy legs to it, the more and more you look into it. So, and the last question, which is about the secret podcast is, do you think the secret is a psychokinetic response to positivity or merely a case of good karma? I think I know what you mean by this question, which is, do I think it's actually psychokinetic ability or kind of just good things happen to good people? Um, I think it's probably both. I do believe in the power of the mind. I don't think it's as simple as I want a new car. So I'm going to put that in the universe. I don't think that's the case at all. Um, but I do think the mind does have, you know, a definite ability to kind of bring things to you. If you truly believe in something and, and work hard for it and, uh, you know, yes, part of it is, you know, positivity uh, it breeds positive outcomes. So I think it's kind of a combination of both. And I, and I do honestly try to live my life that way. I try to always find a way to be, uh, you know, forgiving, to be understanding, um, you know, to not judge people like anybody else. Uh, I, assume, I assume we all do this, right? I mean, or maybe, I don't know, maybe we don't, but as I get older, especially, I really do try to practice what I, what I preach here. And this uh, Blood Red Sky, you know, taught me a lot. And that making that film and seeing kind of the results of the mind state um, really made me feel like I just need to always try to put myself in a positive mind state. And if I do that, whatever the best result that can happen, that's what it would be. That's why I always say to people, hey, stay positive, right? Like, no one's bar never been in a bad situation and someone said, hey, man, just stay negative as fuck, okay? You know, <laughs> we always say stay positive because I think there's an innate belief that we all have that if we just stay positive, positive things will happen. And right now, my positive thing is this podcast, and I hope it continues uh, to make people happy, and I ho hope people enjoy it. I hope you guys share it with your friends. Please like, comment, um, all those things help the podcast get more exposure, and they also uh, let me know you're out there and you're enjoying it. So thank you all for listening to episode number 15, and I'll be back again on Monday with episode number 16. Much love, everybody. All the best, and I will see you on Monday. Take care.